welcome to Serious Business on NDTV. 30 minutes of hard business news. One topic, one speaker, and a conversation that's relevant to you. I'm Manvi Sinha Dhillon. 99% of Indian B2B SaaS or software as a service companies have adopted deep tech innovations. That's according to a new report published by EY India in collaboration with NASCOM. Deep tech and beyond. What are the big trends that are playing out in the Indian SaaS sector? Let's find out from the founder and CEO of Zoho Corporation, an innovator in the SaaS sector. Sridhar Vembu, thank you for joining us on NDTV. Pleasure to have you. Thank you, Mami. Namaste. I want to get straight to it. From your vantage point, what are the big trends that you're seeing playing out in the SaaS sector? And then we'll talk about deep tech in greater detail. Yeah, the big thing that has happened in the last year, year and a half, is both venture capitalists and public markets have started demanding profitability in the SaaS sector, which means that necessarily companies have to adapt, uh, adapt to the new reality where you have to uh, focus more on technology, uh, deep tech, and maybe less on the sales and marketing execution that was fueling growth before. So that is the change that we have seen in the last about a year and a half of uh, in the capital markets, and that has filtered down to most SaaS companies by now. And that adjustment process is healthy because we really need to compete on technology, not just on sales and marketing prowess. And that I think most companies are adjusting to that. That's the big change that we have seen. Well, I was actually going to ask you first up where you're joining us from for this conversation today. But that's such an interesting nugget of information that I'm going to park it for later. Uh, you talked about the big change in the last year and a half, the focus on profitability as far as SaaS companies are concerned. What has the impact then been on the Indian SaaS sector? The fittest surviving or there's still room for evolution? There, there's still a very nascent space, particularly in India. There's still a very uh, young ecosystem. So there's a long uh, growth cycle ahead, but we still, we want to build strong foundations and foundations means like companies that last 20, 30, 40 years, not just that are looking to exit in two, three years. And that's the kind of companies that are being built now. And uh, we what the correction we have seen in the last year, year and a half is healthy from that perspective. And the opportunity is ahead is immense because India itself, for example, is on a major digital transformation wave right now. In fact, India is now Indian companies, particularly with big corporations, could leapfrog the Western companies in terms of technology by adopting newer technology faster. And we see that already, in, for example, in things like UPI, Aadhaar, all of that, where India is well ahead of the West in that. The same kind of transformation is starting to happen in the corporate sector, and we are witnessing that right now. So Indian SaaS companies have a lot of growth to look forward to, but we have to get our act together. Okay. So promising and challenging at the same time, deep tech. You know, for lay viewers who are watching on NDTV, just explain what deep tech means to you. And when I refer to the fact that this EY India NASCOM report says 99% of Indian SaaS companies are looking at deep tech innovations, give us some examples of the kind of innovation you've referred to it in broad terms, but specific innovations that you're seeing. Yeah. So deep tech really means the foundational pieces of technology we all depend on, whether that is silicon, whether it is software, cloud infrastructure, and, and uh, language models, all of that. In other words, the, the technology behind the technology that consumers tend to use. For example, when you look at a, a consumer service like a, you know Facebook or WhatsApp or Google search, there's a lot of deep technology behind the scenes powering all those. And traditionally, Indian companies have not focused on that, but that focus has increased in the recent times. There are companies that are focusing on all of these API gateways to compiler technology to database technology, GPU-based technologies, all of that. And that is a very healthy development because we as a nation have to get into more deep tech. So that's what I mean by that term. And audio video technology, this Zoom is powered by AV technologies. That's also deep tech. 
Okay. Uh, that's a, you know, consumer facing example that many will understand. Uh, just something like Zoom, for example. But, you know, artificial intelligence, and that's a piece of the nugget as well. Uh, mm -hmm the transformative role that it could be playing and bring your Zoho experience into it. What's really happening as far as AI is concerned? How is it changing the way companies like Zoho Corporation are approaching solutions? Logic Chat GPT and then GPT-4, Google responding quickly with BART, all of that, that has landed. And uh, now we are in the phase where consolidation is happening, where we are realizing the limitations of the technology namely the hallucination problem, the truth problem. The AI has a truth problem where it can make up stuff, which makes it very difficult to rely on it from a business context. For example, for legal or marketing, any of that, you just cannot make up stuff. So that is the uh, state we are in. And a lot of R&D is going on into that. And the second big thing about AI right now is this an arms race in terms of GPU compute capacity. Basically, all of this AI in the language models are deployed on GPUs, almost entirely on NVIDIA GPUs. They are in severe short supply. And if you notice last week, NVIDIA had their earnings announcement, a blowout quarter, meaning they had like, you know, I think earnings doubled or something like that, huge numbers. And that just tells you how much demand is there for the GPUs, because everyone, including us, everyone depends on NVIDIA GPUs to, to, to build those models. And those are the two big changes now. First, the truth problem that we have to solve. Second, of course, we have to procure the GPU compute capacity for all the applications that we want to build on AIs, whether it's language translation. For example, this particular conversation can be translated simultaneously in Hindi and Tamil, all of that. That AI can do, but it requires a huge amount of compute capacity, the GPU capacity, which is in short supply right now. Those are the challenges right now. I think we've talked about the backdrop, the landscape, the big picture as far as SaaS companies are concerned. Let's zero in on Zoho specifically. And I, I'm coming back to the question I alluded to. Where are you joining us from today? And that's a very telling sort of uh, feature of the way Zoho recruits and harnesses talent. So where are you uh, joining us from today? Yeah, I am joining you from Tenkasi, which is about 650 kilometers southwest of Chennai. And you know, I'm in a deep rural village. Uh, I just put it this way. To get a haircut, I have to travel about seven kilometers, <laughs> which tells you something. <laughs> so, and yet? And yet? Yet, and I have a really good fiber optic connection, so I'm able to get work done from the company from here. And that's uh, something that you've sort of promoted uh, among uh, Zoho employees, not just yourself. It's not a liberty that you give yourself. It's uh, some... Uh, something that many Zoho employees do, both in India and overseas. Uh, the hub and spoke model, what gave you the confidence that that would really be a differentiating formula? Yeah, uh, first, you know, with the technology, particularly fiber optics now available everywhere, even remote villages like, like mine do have good fiber connectivity now, it's possible to do our kind of work, the knowledge work, software, marketing, all of this from anywhere. That's the first step. And this is a, a step change, a quantum change, a leap from what it was even 10 years ago. We haven't really processed all the implications of this widespread bandwidth availability. That's the first thing. The second is, particularly in our sector, software, people want quality of life, peace and quiet, all of that. That's important. And if you look at R&D centers, even for IBM research or Bell Labs in their heyday, they were actually in rural areas in the US. They were not in major cities. So in a way, it's going back to the model where you can actually set up world-class R&D centers in rural areas. That's what we have done in Tenkasi, and we are spreading that to other districts. We are doing it in three other districts right now. And so those are R&D hubs. They themselves are in a kind of a village, but that would be on a kind of a main highway somewhere. And then we put spokes around where maybe surrounding like in the 20, 30 kilometer region, we put smaller offices where people can work Essentially work from home, but in a work from small office. That's the kind of model. That's what we call a hub and spoke. The hub provides us like I can take big meetings there. I can host customers there, all of that. In the spokes, I can work with a small team, maybe a 10 or 20% team here. So that's the model that we are slowly evolving to us. So tell me, I, and I know that this is something that you're evolving. Uh, so perhaps the verdict will come a few years down the road. But 
from the perspective of talent retention or attracting talent, more widespread pockets of talent, but also managing that talent, has this approach worked out positively for you? I'm presuming it has, but just share, has it really sort of, uh, you know, become a solution to what many other companies are battling, which is attrition? Absolutely. Talent, uh, uh, talent creation, talent nurturing is a very core part of why we do this. It's both from our business interest where we get access to raw talent, which of course we have to nurture and shape, and talent retention. This is something very important for our business. We are in a highly intellectual property heavy business where essentially all of our assets walk out the door every evening, as you say, right? Everything is in the brains of our people. So which means that the talent is the almost all, everything to the business. It's not the buildings, it's not the computers, it's not the infrastructure. All of that is secondary to what's in the uh, heads of our people. And that talent, by situating in these rural areas, we first get access to a vastly bigger talent pool, potential talent pool. Of course, we have to invest in creating and nurturing the talent, which we do well. And as a result, we reap the benefit, which is that the talent we are able to retain better, which directly plays a role in how we build our products. So all of that's in there. There's a virtuous cycle there by being in these areas. Okay, I'm absorbing that point. In a slightly different context, you've talked of Zoho being to India and to the world, what a Samsung from South Korea has managed. Now, you know, that's an example that many people will understand to understand the scale of your ambitions. But have you sort of uh, managed to set the wheels in motion for achieving that scale of ambition and just point out what some of the key ingredients are to achieve what you've set for yourself? Yeah, it's really extensive uh, investment in R&D, research and development, product development, product management, and of course, along with it was marketing, sales, support, a global reach, global brand, all of that. But it starts with that R&D capability. In other words, do we have the capacity, capability to build very advanced, sophisticated products? Like Samsung has shipped that uh, Fold 4. Can we build similar products in India? First, we're doing it in the software area. Can we compete with the Microsoft? Can we compete with the Google? Can we compete with the Salesforce? That's the first capability we are building on a fairly large scale now. We are about 13,000 employees and growing on an easily about 20% clip in terms of headcount. And that is the first building the talent pool, building the capability. The second, of course, a global reach so that we can sell in Dubai, we can sell in the US, we can sell anywhere. You know, that's the second part, which is also goes with what a Samsung has been able to achieve. And I want to point out, South Korea has about 45 million people and a smaller state in India would have more than that. A smaller state in India has more than 40 million people. So we should be able to create at least one Samsung, maybe at least maybe 10 of them, right? It's possible in our nation, somebody has to do it. So that's why we have set our goal to build companies like that, whether it's a Google, Apple, Samsung, Honda, Sony, that type of company has to be built in India. That's why we are you know, very strongly focused on the problem by creating, nurturing talent, taking up very difficult projects, advanced projects, challenging the talent, creating products, and then creating a global expansion, which the philosophy we call it transnational localism, setting up offices around the world, setting up data centers, that's part of the expansion strategy. You've got two levers uh, moving at the same time, the software piece and the hardware piece. Uh, forgive me as an outsider if I say that's somewhat unusual. Explain the logic of the hardware piece and why it makes sense to you. Yeah, we are building data centers worldwide. We are a cloud provider, software provider, but we depend on our own cloud infrastructure, which means buying a lot of hardware. And we believe we can bring a lot of efficiencies to this how the software interfaces with the hardware. If we invest in the hardware, we can design them together. It's exactly the logic in the consumer or in the, uh, in the uh, laptop and phone, Apple has reaped the benefits of building hardware and software together. But you could actually do this in the data center as well. That's what we are investing in those capabilities. In fact, we have an office in Nagpur, 
that I created about where we have about 40 hardware engineers working on building these servers, storage, all of that, that go into our data centers worldwide. And we also have uh, chip design efforts going on where we build the semiconductors, we design the semiconductors that go into these data centers. So these are all some of the efforts. They won't pay off instantly, they won't pay off like next year, but over 10 years, they will be huge for us. You know, we're painting a picture as if this is all easy, and I'm sure it's not. So what are some of the limitations and the challenges as you proceed on this path to achieve, whether it's the Samsung analogy or it is the hardware piece uh, sort of ramping up? What are the limitations and challenges you're experiencing on the ground? Well, the first one is, of course, we have to get the know-how. We have to build up that know-how, the capability to do this. It's so like we may want, let's say, let's say I set a goal, we have to build a phone that's as capable as an iPhone or a Samsung phone. That's not a, you know, a, a start trivial challenge. It's, you have to have the know-how in all areas of that, whether it's display or antennas, all of that. So building that talent pool is the first challenge. That applies to software, any of those databases, any of those the same challenge. That's a big challenge. And then the second big one is retain the, cha retain the talent. Because companies generally tend not to retain the talent well. That's a big challenge. Because if we don't retain the talent, you cannot build all these long-term R&D projects. So those are the big challenges. And then, of course, along the way, the business has to keep funding it. You have to make enough money to fund all this. And you cannot just keep going to the market to you know uh, raise money. So that's the third biggest challenge. And that's also a challenge. Well, on that note, I'm going to take a break. And when we return on serious business, I'm going to just draw up a list of all of the things that Sridhar Vembu and Zoho Corporation have done differently, ways in which they have defied conventional wisdom. That's when serious business returns. Welcome back to Serious Business on NDTV. We're in conversation today with Sridhar Vembu, founder and CEO of Zoho Corporation, a SaaS software as a service company, a space that's uh, really showing growth potential in the Indian context, serving the global marketplace. Uh, Sridhar, things that you've done differently. We've already talked about the fact that uh, transnational localization, okay. did I get the phrase okay. right? Transnational localization. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, that's one aspect. The fact that you're joining us from this uh, for this interview from a remote village in Tamil Nadu, the fact that you're building up a hub and spoke approach uh, to talent and know-how across India and in the United States, from what I've read as well, you sort of move outside the conventional big city approach. Uh, but a few of the other things that you've done, uh, for example, growing Zoho, You've actually chosen to rely on internal accruals to map uh, the first chapters of growth. That and other things that, you know, where you've defied conventional wisdom. Yes, um, there is a reason for that, why we chose to do that way. Uh, to, kind of, to invest in the type of long-term projects, like we are building hardware, that's not going to pay off for at least five years, maybe 10 years. Public markets or venture capitalists will not be that patient. They cannot afford to be patient because you are, you know, the public investors or the limited partners will demand faster returns. So that's one reason. And we felt that by investing our own money in R&D, long-term R&D, that that's a long-term benefit, but short-term, it's not justifiable. So that's a freedom that we want. That's why we chose to build this way. The second, that all of the things about the rural expansion, all of these, come with the same type of thing. We invest in talent. There are times like we take a student and train and for that to pay off, it may take two years. For two years, we are paying that person and it may take two years for that investment to pay off, for them to become productive and add value to the company. And we are willing to do that because it's a crucial part of our talent creation, talent nurturing program. So all of these are only possible in my uh, strong conviction, it's only possible because we are a private company and we are not beholden to these quarterly pressures. That's why we chose to operate this way. Does it limit the pace of growth in any sense? Uh, and uh, is that a true 
that uh, you have made very knowingly because you saw the benefits of being allowed to invest freely and with a long-term horizon? It probably did in the early days, but we are now 25 years in. And if you look at large public companies, they, of course, generate their own uh, profits to invest back into the business. It's not like a Microsoft or Google are going back to the stock market for money. So we have reached a point where we are able to fund our own long-term investments, but it took longer for us to reach that stage. So in other words, this question makes sense looking backward. 15 years ago, maybe it would have grown faster if you took outside money, but today we wouldn't have had the freedom we have today. That was the trade-off. We were happy to make the trade-off. Indeed. And that's evident in the conversation and your 25-year journey at Zoho. Uh, one final uh, thought I wanted you to elaborate on. Uh, there are, uh, you know, new aspirants in the SaaS space, uh, but beyond SaaS as well, the Indian entrepreneurial spirit is on display. And we use the word startup in a very broad sense. But, you know, these are all entrepreneurs with ideas, many of them riding on technology. Uh, based on your own experiences, if you had to put down two or three mantras that have guided you successfully over 25 years, uh, what would those two, three mantras be? Primarily, the first thing is it's all about the talent you're able to create and nurture in a company. Because ultimately, the biggest asset for any company is the talent pool, the people you have. So focus on that squarely. That's important. How you take care of your people how you retain your people. So a lot of companies do a really good job at all, getting talent into the company, but they don't do a, such a good job retaining the talent. That's equally important. So that's the first big thing I would say, almost good. At all. Nothing else comes close to that as important. The second one I'd say, why we do this, you know, the, for example, we mind the, the store in terms of costs, where we spend the money. One reason we avoid the big cities is also you know, the cost of living, both cost of living as reflected in what our employees encounter, which directly impacts the retention. And second, the cost of doing business for our company as well. Like the rent is high, everything is the transport is high, all of that. So that's the second lesson that uh, if you are long term oriented, it really matters. It won't matter you know, if you are like focused on an exit in three or five years, but it will matter if you want to be around 25, 30 years. So that's the second biggest one. And so that something that I wish I had done better. Like I would, I know, in early days, in the early days, I'm an engineer by training and by mental habits. I wish I had been a better salesperson in the early days. That's something that every entrepreneur should be better at selling. That's something if I were to tell myself, go back in time, I would say become a better salesperson. That's what I would advise myself. Right. Well, that's an honest admission. Sridhar Rembu, thank you so much for joining us on Serious Business on NDTV. Pleasure talking to you and gaining those insights. Thank you. Thank you.